My name is Daniel Sally. I am a colleague of uh, Marjorie Mandel and Anna Gomez here at Concordia. I teach in the School of Indian Public Affairs, and I will be uh, moderating the discussion. Um, a few weeks ago, not a few weeks, I'm sorry, a few months ago, rather, last spring, this book was published by uh, Harvard University Press, uh, The Power of Market Fundamentalism, Carl Blandy's Critique. It's uh, quite an important book. Uh, it was published, of course, and written by Fred Block and uh, Margaret Summers. Uh, it's an important book for us because, of course, this is written by two uh, preeminent uh, Polanyi scholars, uh, very well known in our, in our circle. And um, they have uh, achieved, uh, I think, a great deal of, of uh, important, uh, an important contribution uh, with respect to making uh, Polanyi's work uh, better known. Um, probably, I don't know if it's a recent book, so many of you may not have read the book. So before I introduce uh, our uh, panel, I want to just perhaps summarize very briefly uh, the main points of the book. Um, as, as I said, the, the title of the book is The Power of Market Fundamentalism, Carl and the Critique. And in this book, the authors, uh, Fred Block and Peggy Summers, tried to explain basically our sort of three questions that I could see. What is it about the free market ideas that give them such extraordinary command? Uh, second question is, what is the source of this power? And finally, how is it that ideas once marginalized and seemingly defeated in the 30s and 40s have uh, become again our society's conventional wisdom? In answering such questions, uh, Block and Summers basically, their purpose is to elaborate, as they quote, as I quote them here, an emergent inventory of concept concepts that provides leverage for illuminating and explaining the complex socioeconomic and political development that have brought us to the crisis we find ourselves in today. And basically, they build their analysis of Polanyi's uh, social theory around a conceptual, what they call a conceptual armature, comprised of three Polanyian themes that have essentially uh, captured their attention. The first one is, while markets are necessary, they're also fundamentally threatening to human freedom and collective good. Uh, secondly, the free markets, the free markets celebrated by economists and political libertarians has never actually existed and cannot in fact ever exist. And uh, thirdly, the third concept is that, or the third theme rather, is that the seductive persistence of free market ideology is rooted in its promise to reduce the role of politics and civic, in civic and social life. Uh, this book, I believe, uh, personally develops a very powerful uh, framework for understanding uh, and critiquing the internal logic of contemporary uh, neoliberal uh, discourse. And of course, as well, the inherent threat that actually existing neoliberalism poses to democracy. So in my view, it's a, it's a major achievement. And I think we have, uh, we're lucky to have this opportunity to discuss the book. To uh, discuss this book, we have a panel of, uh, you, you might wonder why uh, Peggy and Fred are speaking first, because we don't have like, that much time, so that's why I summarized the book for them. But uh, <laughs> they'll, they'll speak after, they'll speak after. But uh, to, 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 to discuss this book, uh, we are first going to hear uh, Robert Kuttner. Uh, we've heard him this morning. Uh, I don't need to introduce him more, except to say that, of course, he's the author of uh, several important books. Uh, and uh, uh, in fact, he wrote a quite insightful uh, review of the book uh, in the April 15th issue of The American Prospect. And then we'll hear uh, Jamie Peck, as we just heard him uh, a little while ago. Uh, Jamie Peck is a Canada Research Chair in Urban and Regional Political Economy and Professor of Geography at the University of British Columbia. He is the author as well of Constructions of Neoliberal Reason, which was published in 2010. And he's the co-author of a forthcoming book called Fast Policy, Experimental Statecrafts, and the Thresholds of Neoliberalism. And finally, we will hear, of course, Jerry uh, <coughs> Polanyi Levitt, who uh, doesn't need uh, introduction. Uh, we all know who she is. It's very, largely thanks to her that we are on here today. So I will start with you, Bob, asking you to uh, but tell us what you make of this book. Well, thank you. Uh, this is, this is something new for me, to be on a panel with the authors, uh, not to mention with, with Carrie. So this is a, a double challenge. Um, well, first of all, I think the book is a really powerful reintroduction of Polanyi at a moment when more and more people should be reading Polanyi because, of course, as we've been saying all day, of the relevance of his analysis, his insights to the uh, 
the resurrection of, uh, of neoliberalism uh, at a time when neoliberalism, once again, um, uh, has wrought social catastrophe, but it continues to be the beast that just won't die. Um, secondly, uh, just to flag a couple of things that I found particularly interesting and particularly well done about this book, um, Fred and Peggy go back and they look, they, they, uh, they re-research, in a sense, uh, Polanyi's research of Spienhamland. And uh, whereas uh, many of us, I think, are um, inclined to be almost hagiographic about the originality and the oppressions of his analysis, they find that the master didn't quite get everything right, that um, there was more diversity in England in the late, uh, in terms of poor relief, in terms of the regulation of the poor, in terms of the persistence of the pre-existing social economy, and the traditional rights of the poor, uh, a little bit more diversity variety than Polanyi suggested by almost reifying what the justices did in 1795 in uh, Spienhamland. Uh, he almost used it as a metaphor, or uh, to be fancy, a synecdoche, uh, for what turned out to be generalizable. But it wasn't quite generalized. Uh, in, uh, in 1795, according to uh, the Block and Summers, not to take anything away from Polanyi, because the larger truth, uh, I think he got absolutely right. Another thing I found very interesting was the discussion of Polanyi and Marx. Now, as I, as I indicated uh, in, in my earlier comments, uh, uh, the world seems more Marxian now than it did when I first read Polanyi 50 years ago as an undergraduate. Uh, concepts that seemed a little bit strained, like the use of capital as a collective noun describing people, uh, or uh, the idea of the state as the, uh, the the executive committee of the ruling class, or the reserve army of the unemployed, or, you know, pick your Marxian concept. It rings much truer now, immiseration, uh, the proletarianization, of professional occupations. Uh, pick your Marxian concept. It has new resonance today. It certainly has more resonance than it did then. And as they suggest, there is a fair amount of overlap uh, between uh, Polanyi and Marx, uh, as Kari suggested. Uh, it would be really interesting, even more interesting than the notion of conversation between Ostrom and Polanyi to have that conversation today between Marx and Polanyi. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I still, 50 years later, as the world looks more Marxian, I still find, if I have to choose, Polanyi more congenial than Marx. Why? Well, because um, Marx is still a little more formulaic uh, than Polanyi, uh, where Marx sees iron laws or rules. Polanyi seems pre sees predispositions. Mm -hmm. And uh, if, you, if you look at uh, Polanyi in, in Red Vienna, uh, Polanyi's uh, sensibility was that it's possible to uh, organize uh, working class people as a counterweight to uh, corporate capitalism, as a counterweight to the market, and, and make some inroads, maybe fight them to a draw and even go beyond that to have some form of Christian socialism or democratic socialism, whereas Marx's theory of human agency was that uh, they should just overthrow the damn thing and be done with it. And I, I find Polanyi rather more nuanced and more interesting, and, and in some ways, many ways, uh, more hopeful. Um, which is not to say that there are not a lot of Marxian insights that are very useful, and I find myself, in, in my senescence, um, sounding more Marxian than I did 50 years ago, because I think the world has become, as I say, more Marxian. So um, to conclude, I know the time is short and everybody should have a chance to hold forth. Um, for me, uh, Polanyi was uh, tremendously influential, both in terms of the way I look at the world and the project of understanding the world, but also as a kind of role model uh, as someone who was, as I said before, a trespasser 
uh, a journalist who became kind of a self-taught uh, theorist and intellectual. And um, I think the, the lesson for younger people of today, which Fred and Peggy, I think, teach very well, is um, appreciate the relevance of this masterwork for ills that recur and are recurring in our own time. Uh, read history and uh, transgress across disciplinary boundaries. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Jamie to uh, maybe okay. follow suit on that. Sure. Um, one, when we attend these kinds of sessions at other meetings, it's usually one of the questions in the mind of the audience is, uh, should I buy this book? <laughs> um, I assume with this audience and this book that there's no need to suggest that you buy the book. You're all going to buy the book. So in, instead, I'm going to suggest that what you need to do, given the responsibility of being at a Polanyi conference, is you need to buy three copies of the book and give at least two away. Um, uh, because it's got to get beyond... Yeah. No, you give them away, don't sell them. Um, so it's got to get beyond the, uh, the conversation that has already developed at this conference over the years. I know even though it's my first time, I've watched it uh, from a distance uh, with great interest. Uh, I was going to start off with the issue of Marx and Polanyi as well. Um, I'm one of those people who's greedy and wants both. And um, actually, I see no reason why we can't use them together. I think they give us different kinds of things. And it's often said that um, those people that manage to get through all three volumes of Capital uh, feel moved to write a book about it. Uh, and if you think about Capital, we do have a big kind of secondary literature on Capital of book-length reflections uh, on interpretations of the book, and, and there are many interpretations of it. Um, I would suggest that with Polanyi we don't have many of those. This is perhaps one of the first real book-length serious reflections on the, on the Great Transformation and the other work. Um, and so I think it means that we've reached a kind of different threshold in the conversation, where I'm now going to move into a conversation of different interpretations of Polanyi that can be put into conversation with one another. And I'm thinking of conversations between Fred and Peggy's book and Gareth Dale's book, uh, with Nancy Fraser's recent uh, reinterpretations of Polanyi in the Triple Movement, suddenly we've got this really enriched conversation about uh, how to use Polanyi in this flexible way, not in a literalist way, uh, as I just emphasized in the previous session. I don't think that's especially constructive to go for textual literalism. Uh, we should be learning from the spirit and, the, and recognize that the Polanyi framework itself was constructed to be flexible. Mm -hmm. uh, he produced it through an analysis of the, the moving tectonic plates of early and mid 20th century capitalism and its various uh, others. Um, so he produced it in real time in a fast changing world. If you were here today, I'm sure his framework would still be evolving as the world around uh, uh, continues to change. So we need this active, I think, uh, conversation around Polanyi's work. And, and I think this book um, is an absolutely major contribution to that active uh, uh, conversation. Uh, you mentioned in the uh, preface, I think, that you don't want to get preoccupied with the tangles of reinterpretation. Now, that strikes me as exactly the the right spirit on which to, to move forward into a different kind of, of conversation, not to kind of keep tracking back, but to look forward and see how we can use it. Uh, my sense is that we're, if we look back over time, there's been kind of a lumpiness to Polanyi's influence. He disappeared at some points uh, in history, then reappeared. Um, it seems to me that his reappearance post-2008 um, is quite different to the earlier ones. The, the audience seems to be wider and deeper than before. Um, I think there are people you can assemble under the sign of Polanyi today. Um, uh, it's a different crowd of people that you could have assembled, let's say, in the early 1980s. And so uh, I think there's lots of uh, things to realize from this uh, different political moment. Um, so I've said already that this is not a fixed framework, and I think that Peggy and uh, uh, and Fred are working in, in that spirit of 
given us a different interpretation of it. What they do interpretively in this book, and I think this is an area where we could have you know, a bit of a debate or a conversation, is they emphasise this ideational moment of Polanyi. Uh, and and of, there are many Polanyis that we can, uh, we can uh, use, and, and that's certainly uh, one of them. Um, and they say, if I can find the right uh, phrase, um, quote, how major transformations are ideationally driven and how ideas have causal powers, close quote. Now, you've no need to convince me of the importance of ideational uh, arguments. I do uh, this, use the same kinds of methods myself. Uh, in the book, they talk about Charles Murray's uh, work on, on, on uh, the critique of the welfare state and so on, and the way that it, in many respects, sort of begat uh, welfare reform in the Clinton uh, Gingrich era. Um, now, I think at one level that's kind of undeniably true, but it also highlights the hazards of, of analysing um, ideational histories because, of course, we select retrospectively on the ideas that were proved to be true and we sort of forget uh, the lost uh, ideas. Um, and, and so it's always difficult, I think, to reassemble an ideational history when you know how it all played out. Um, but the other point I would make about an ideational analysis um, is I think we need to run that alongside uh, an institution. We need the institutionalist Polanyi and the substantivist economist Polanyi to be running aside the ideational analysis at at least the same level of analytical privilege. And I'll make the point with respect to, um, to welfare, and then I'll stop. Uh, with welfare reform, for example, it's true that Charles Murray's kind of visionary view of how welfare might transform kind of came unpleasantly true in the United States uh, uh, after 1996. But there were institutional and material uh, parallel conditions that enabled that story to become true. The institutional uh, part of it is the fact that there was a governor's uh, constituency for welfare reform by the late 1980s that produced a kind of impatient push uh, for transformative uh, reform and made, and when, when they started to issue waivers to allow governors to experiment um, quite willy-nilly with, with welfare, um, in, in many respects that was rendering the federal framework already ruptured. Um, so what was unthinkable when Charles Murray wrote his book, Devolution to the 50 States, became practically inevitable by 1996. So we can remember that Charles Murray was regarded as too radical by Ronald Reagan to work in the White House in uh, 1981 when he was considered for a job there. And it was largely because he advocated devolution of welfare. But within a few years, the institutional conditions had changed that devolution kind of was no longer almost a big deal by 1996 because the governors had pushed it. The other thing I'll add is on the material e economic side, what made welfare reform possible was the production of contingent work, uh, the, the way in which the economy started to generate more and more fragmented jobs, that created the possibility, the, the churn in the economy, which makes workfare possible. Uh, workfare isn't possible unless there's an extreme churn in the economy, where there are lots of vacancies generated all the time. Yeah, Charles Murray and the Manhattan Institute didn't produce the contingent uh, labour market. That was produced by other kind of social forces. So I think alongside the ideational analysis, which is vital, uh, we want a kind of parity of um, analytical esteem uh, given to these institutional and substantive moments uh, of change. But I'll stop by saying this is um, it's just a fantastic book. I think it enriches the conversation and lifts it all to the next level. And I think the kinds of discussions we can have from now on will be different to the ones uh, we had so far. So thank you for the book. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you. Uh, Carrie Levitt, your turn. Well, first, I'd like to take that opportunity of saying what I would have said this morning if I had known that Bob Cutner was there, but I did I knew it was on the program, but I didn't know you were really there. Because I, I, I in my um, little mental notes, I, wish, I wanted to say that the... Um, that article marking the 70th anniversary of the Great Transformation in your American Prospect, to my mind, is 
is the best summary of that book I have ever read anywhere, and I'd recommend it very strongly to anybody it's uh, to give it to students <laughs> and so on. It's on live. It's free, I think. Yeah. Thank boy, that means a lot to me. Thank you. Uh, you know, I, I was uh, going to say that, but I didn't know if you were in the room. <laughs> you know, as I said, I think that this morning again that really uh, we owe an enormous amount to Fred for um, for um, over very very many years um, writing about the work of Karl Polanyi and then eventually uh, the book which we have here and I think we have arrived at the point I think as uh, Jamie was saying uh, that this has become uh, the, the writings of Karl Polanyi have become a sort of minor classic, the great transformation. And uh, so there, can, there will be many interpretations and one can be uh, free to, to agree or differ with them. And I think that we are now so, in a sense, so firmly, uh, Polanyi is now so uh, firmly back in the picture that we could discuss Fred and Margaret's book freely and critically. And I would like to be critical. But what is really great is that I feel totally comfortable uh, among all of us to be critical. And that is not going to hurt either their book or my father's reputation because it, it's, it's beyond the, the um, and I have, I think, three, um, three, three um, concerns. Let me start, and it's not a new story, about the chapter on the writing of the Great Transformation, because to me, that is um, the, um, the, the contention there. <coughs> that um, Polanyi in the first part when he write started was uh, uh, influenced by Marxism and then uh, somewhere along the way he introduced other terminology and then he didn't have time uh, to uh, revise the manuscript in order to make it uh, coherent and put these two different uh, perspectives somehow. And, and this, of course, well, there was an article thread had about that already, and the, the chapter it, in the book is very similar to that article. And I must tell you that I really think that this is entirely misconceived suggestion. Um, and um, the idea that he was a Marxist in the 30s, and then after spending uh, the time in Bennington, the United States, uh, somehow uh, changes uh, perspective. Uh, it 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 doesn't it really doesn't make sense. And somewhere, uh, a few lines uh, perhaps thrown away there, that to the effect that when he came to England and he was a Marxist, then he didn't go to run to join. I'm quoting more or less this or that kind of radical group or something like that. Uh, I, 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 th I think that this really is a profound misunderstanding. Now, as I said this morning, um, when he came to England, the Grand family was his, uh, his, um, his social um, support uh, system. And they were friends from Vienna. But more than that, um, there is correspondence with Donald Grant, even from the Vienna days. Uh, the Grants were, um, were working for the uh, student uh, Christian movement in Europe. Donald Grant uh, had been sent, went to uh, Russia in uh, the famine times in 19, uh, 1919, 1920 from Vienna and so on. And uh, there was, in my father's Vienna days already, contact not only with the Grants who were um, Christian socialists, but also 
with um, a, um, a fellow uh, by the name of Otto Bauer, not to be confused with the famous uh, leader who was called the Little Otto Bauer in the family of the Kleine Otto Bauer, uh, who was a, a Christian socialist but a Catholic. So, and he had a journal, uh, and my father wrote an article in Vienna that was published in that journal, that is to be found, um, which was in some ways the first draft of uh, The Essence of Fascism, which was published in English already in 1934. Um, so, we're I'm coming, I will come to the Marxism in a moment, but I'm just reminding you that there was this connection with um, Christian socialism. It was from Vienna through the grants. It was there in London. Now, when he was in London, it is then that he, um, he became the translator and instructor of the Christian left group uh, in that volume, a uh, German uh, volume of, of uh, recently found, recently published uh, works of Karl Marx, including the, uh, including the Paris manuscript and in, including the, uh, the Feuerbach and the, uh, the whole lot of them. Actually, two <coughs> volumes, I remember they were blue in cover. I, I can see uh, the volumes, unfortunately, they have been lost. So there was a Marxist study group uh, um, in the context of a, a, of a group of Christian socialists. Uh, then, um, so what well, is that the Marxism that was referred to, that he brought from England? I don't know. He wrote a number of uh, uh, things to, for the Leeds, um, his friend Leeds on Marxism. They were mostly rather critical because he was uh, critical of Marxism. Uh, but I, I may say I never read any, anything, any reference to the work of Marx in anything by my father that was critical. The criticisms were always directed at Marxism. Uh, and and um, of course, he, he was shocked at what he found in England. I think he, he was uh, shocked in his own way, and hence the dark satanic mills, as, uh, as a young Marx was when Engels took him to, uh, to, to, to the textile factory. Um, we've seen pictures of that. Uh, and he was shocked at the, at the, at the inhuman uh, working conditions, uh, as I say, as was Marx. And um, anyway, uh, I, I want, uh, because we're on the one issue here, no, and I know I'm talking too much, and but I want to just... You're running out of time. <laughs> I'm running out of time, and I'm still with that chapter three. <laughs> and, and, and I'm telling you that I actually have proof and evidence of the fact that there's no way that what uh, is said about that chapter could be true, because it's a letter that my father wrote to me. And that letter I reproduced in... in in uh, Galpalani in Vienna in the second edition. Uh, and I have it, and I think I put it on my website. Uh, because what it said is that he wrote in 1941, uh, and it's a story. He said, my car is addressed to me personally, and uh, we, I now have taken the introduction, I've delivered it. It's 20,000 pages. I was going to make it three times as long, the introduction, the, the notes, but I, I, I won't. I have started to write the book. Uh, from the time I wrote the first chapter, I could see the entire pattern of the book was set. It's going to have uh, 25 chapters in the middle, etc. I am not going to do any more reading uh, because, uh, and then I, mother is here, my mother was there and very helpful because he can read to her three or four pages at a time and she will type it for him. <laughs> he, he couldn't use a typewriter uh, at all, never did. Um, 
no, look, there, there is no way. We, we've all, almost everybody here has had to write stuff, including the students. Uh, have to write lots of papers. And if you have written something, and you have some problem with the logic of the thing, you know you have a problem. And you don't say that this thing wrote itself, it was wonderful, everything was clear from the beginning, and it just went right through. It is true that the, the last two penult penultimate chapters, uh, he didn't complete uh, for another reason, but it, it's simply a misunderstanding. And uh, I guess I've gone over my time, well, and I just want to leave the chapter three. You have three concerns. You have, I'm giving you two more minutes for the other two Give concerns. Give me two more minutes. Okay. <laughs> yes, I do. I do have two more concerns. Well, it, it's a big concern, and of course it is the always embedded economy. I have read insists on the always embedded economy. I, I think that I think this is true only in a trivial way. It is true in a trivial sense that, of course, our, a market must always, markets don't exist in vacuum. Uh, they only exist like that in textbooks, but n no intelligent person would imagine that markets exist like that in, 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 in some abstract form. So there are laws. It is, they are instituted, it's an instituted process, to use my father's word, and they're instituted in law and in custom and in all kinds of ways. So, in that sense, they are, of course, instituted. Uh, but um, embedded has got another meaning, meaning that they are embedded in, its, in, in the social, in the society, not only uh, in institutions uh, without which markets can't function at all. And, um, and, and that kind of formulation, it, it simply defines disembeddedness out of existence. It, it, that cannot happen. There cannot be, in any sense of the word, disembedded economy if the economy is always embedded. And, uh, to my mind, and I've said that before, uh, that removes the radical and critical aspect of Polanyi, which was, and it was said more than once, that the economy is disembedded from society in a way in which no previous civilization had, uh, it had previously existed, because then the society and its institutions are re-engineered in order to be compatible with and serve the capitalist economy of private ownership, because we're not talking in an abstract way, we was talking about the market otherwise capitalist economy. And so I, I find that the, uh, and that goes, I suppose, with the last point, give me one minute. Three seconds. With, 30 seconds, it has to do with the fact that socialism is not found in the index at all. It's absent. I look at social, social exclusion, three citations, social something. Social naturalism has got about 15 citations. And therefore, it seems to me that the book is so concerned with a very American problem, really, of social policy and the importance of social policy and uh, its reference to Spinomland, uh, etc., um, that makes it perhaps very suitable for the United States. But uh, in a more general way, I think it limits the book. It does not address the fact that Polanyi was a socialist. No. In the first chapter, yes, that is that is there. In, a, in the article in Dissent, written by Fred and Peggy, which I like very much, socialism is there. But that's 2014. And I just wondered why it took to 2014 for socialism to come into this book to be mentioned at all. And, and, and I cannot help thinking I may be wrong. It really has a great deal to do with um, 
with the cultural atmosphere of the United States, where socialism is demonized in, 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 in so many ways that, uh, um, I guess, that's all. Okay, well, thank you very much for the, two, the three of you. Uh, we have the authors who are going to uh, comment on the comments. Uh, Fred Block, as we know, is a research professor at, uh, in sociology at the University of California, Davis. And uh, Margaret Summers is a professor of history and sociology at the University of Michigan. Um, obviously, you've had uh, quite the interesting comments. I, I might want to add maybe another layer myself. Um, in part, uh, in reaction to what uh, Bob Gardner said about the, 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 the overlap between Polanyi and Marx, and also in reaction to as well to uh, the insistence of uh, Jamie Peck on uh, the ide ideational moment, one could say that does do ideas really matter? I mean, you you spend a lot of uh, emphasis uh, on ideas, and, and in fact, your own analysis of, of Marx uh, of Polanyi, sorry, is is uh, very uh, focused on on ideas as though ideas had a life of their own, in fact, were uh, the cause of everything. I mean, if you overlap with Marx, if there is this overlap with Marx, one could say, well, not really, because Marx would say on the contrary, social relations probably determine ideas themselves as well. So uh, I just wanted to add another layer, perhaps some things that you could uh, deal with or answer to. And uh, okay, uh, so it's between you and, uh, you, you decide the time you have. Uh, <laughs> you have another 10 minutes uh, between you and Peggy. <laughs> okay, well, I get to use the first five minutes. and. Um, so first, I just want to say how grateful we are to, to be here. It's just an enormous honor to have a session devoted to our book and have such serious comments. And, and Daniel, your introduction of, you know, was, was excellent. So we're, we're first extraordinarily uh, grateful. The, the second thing is that, um, that, um, the, that none of the criticisms we've heard here really um, really hurt because we criticized each other's drafts much more ferociously. Um, the, the real thing is that it took us something like 15 years to produce this book. We, we know that it's imperfect, we know there are problems with it, but that we figured that rather than wait another 15 years, we should try to, uh, try, try to get it out there. So let me, um, um, there, there are lots of issues on the table, but let, let me respond on the ideational issue and kind of why we push so hard in the direction of emphasizing um, the, the importance of ideas in, in the story that we told. And we, we did the, that not be, uh, I'll try to say it positively, we continue to believe that things like class power and, the, and class struggle um, are extremely important in um, I explaining why, why things happen in, in history. But that uh, we feel very strongly that, uh, that in most of the accounts that we have, the importance of ideas is actually underplayed. And I, I guess the way in which I think about that most importantly is that um, when the extremely rich people say, um, we want to redistribute a lot of income away from the rest of you people because we're enormously greedy and you know, we think that having tens of millions and possibly billions of dollars is really good, um, that nobody, nobody listens and defers to them. It's when they have um, the advantage of a story about how the world works, which is the story that market liberalism, market fundamentalism, whatever we want to call it, uh, because that story um, essentially hides and obscures the material interests behind it, um, it is extraordinarily important. And so we kind of are thinking about these questions kind of over the long view, and that um, for, um, something like 100 years, more than 100 years, um, socialist um, movements were on the march because their ideas were more persuasive. And that there's a turning point which happens at the end of the 60s, the beginning of the 1970s, 
where the ideas of the left cease to have that, that power, and it's the ideas of the right, which we argue were deeply utopian, um, that shifts the balance of forces. And we see that as an injunction as well um, to, the, to, to the left, to, to everybody with whom we identify, that um, as a political project, um, engaging in social struggle is extremely important. Uh, creating new types of, of institutions is extremely important, but we need to have a, a new governing philosophy. We new, need to have a vision of what human freedom could be. Exactly what Polanyi was talking about in the last chapter of The Great Transformation. Now it's your turn. Vicky, you want to add something to that? Uh, yeah, just uh, quickly. Um, on Marx and, and Polanyi, um, one of the things that I, I um, am uh, hoping to write at some point in my remaining um, years is the story, uh, the mystifying story of how it was that the left uh, decided to turn away from Marxism at, in the 70s at precisely the moment that the world decided to become more reflective of what Marx actually said. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and that like yeah. ships passing in the night, the left became more and more obscure and irrelevant and uh, I mean, you know, we all had our post-structuralist moments, okay, but still, um, <laughs> you know, the, the, the ferocity of the anti-Marxism, Mar the so-called post-Marxism that, that existed in people who were supposedly sort of quasi-friendly, like the Scotch Poles of the world who decided that the state was completely autonomous and had its own interests at exactly the time that the state was transforming. That is a story that needs to be explained. And, um, and it's always remarkably uh, reassuring to me when people say, gee, the state really is the, you know, the exec but uh, there were reasons. There were, there were reasons that it didn't appear that way um, at the time. Uh, because people were coming out of the 60s when it was much more uh, nuanced. Uh, uh, so that's, that is an important question. Um, secondly, about ideas. This is something which um, we are uh, taken to task for quite a bit. And I, I think that, um, again, to reiterate Fred, that this is a matter, once again, of proportionality. The notion of the embedded, uh, of the market being institutionally embedded had always been framed as a political and or legal or regulatory form of embeddedness. The term ideational embeddedness, which, you know, for better or for worse, we did coin, mm -hmm. just simply didn't exist. There was no notion, even though, as I said this morning, chapter 10 of the Great Transformation is such a, you can't, could never understand his argument without really mm -hmm becoming engaged with his story of the discovery of political economy, classical political economy, um, discovering nature, and by contrast, Robert Owen, the socialist, discovering society. Um, by the way, um, on Carrie's point about, that is a failure of indexation um, <laughs> at, at big time, and, and the fact that I wasn't even aware of it till you pointed it out. Makes another reason to yell at Harvard U University Press's <laughs> failures. Um, uh, not to mention the fact that we came out the same day as Piketty by the same press, um, <laughs> which we'll never, never forgive them for. Um, but I, I think that I think that's one area where we'll have to agree to disagree. I think that we. Um, the whole framing of the last chapter, in particular, the reality of society. Um, which Abe Rothstein did so much to help us think about back in the in the eighties, um, um, is Polanyi's was our attempt to show how Polanyi was creating an alternative socialist vision of freedom, and it was an anti Hayekian, an anti uh, free enterpriseian, but it was very much a notion of socialism as the subordination of the economy to democratization yeah. processes. Yeah. And um, we, part of why that may have been obscured is that 
we were, most of the time we were writing this was as neoliberalism was just rising and rising and rising and we were so anxious to sort of bring a Polanyian perspective to how it had these powers. Um, the last point about ideas I want to make, also go back to that, um, is that um, um, one of the things that, that we think was, has always been overstated in, at least for me, in sociology is the notion, is what's called the sociology of ideas. The sociology of ideas has really suffers from an abundance of historicism, which Polanyi, if anything, was anti-historicist. Polanyi believed in the power of concepts to help us understand across time and space, always trying to relate them. What we show is that you could never understand neoliberalism, market fundamentalism, and whatever we want to call it, and the, and the power of welfare reform, if you really believe that ideas are totally bound to their contextual framing. The whole pr premise of that argument is that this was Malthusianism reinvented. And um, yes, of course there are nuances and shifts and so forth, but when we put these quotations next to each other between Malthus and Murray, and you take away the linguistic flourishes of the 19th century and late 18th century, um, the arguments are identical. And so the question then becomes, how is it that certain ideas, not all ideas are created equal, and, and that's an important point. Why is it that those ideas that have this kind of causal powers are often the ideas that defy all um, sociological understanding of ideas because they float above time and space? Now, the question is, why at certain points are they more or less resonant? why at certain times do they have more or less causal, causal powers. But the idea that ideas even ha have causal powers is something that we have to understand how. Nonetheless, the question of why ideas gain currency at particular times, as I was saying this morning, has everything to do with structural crisis and has to do with the way that ideas can be used to step in and re-explain, the, the re-narrativize um, how the world works. And that capacity is where we turn to this notion of the conversion narrative, um, which converts the standard story about how the world works and, and shows two competing futures and basically says, stick to the old uh, New Deal-ish version and you're going to end up you know, in a Hobbesian universe, you know, convert to our utopian notion and you're going to end up, you know, with, with flowers and, and heavenliness. So the ways, the, the mechanisms by which these conversions happen, I think, uh, we think are extremely important. And by the way, Polanyi, I think, was very much of a critical geographer. Um, the, the great transformation, especially the historical parts, are very geographically um, grounded. And the last point is about the, the frailty of, of the kind of pragmatic institutionalism which the left has, the social democratic left, I should say, um, which believes in empirical disconfirmation. I mean, imagine disconfirmation by reality. That is not a problem that neoclassical economics has ever suffered from. Um, and this is something that really needs to be you know, recognized, that it had, neoclassical ideas have never met a fact that has had any influence whatsoever. And like all, um, like all religious sects, it is precisely the disconfirmation that reinforces the conviction. Why? Because faith is faith in work in things not seen, right? I mean, it's precisely the, the contrary empiricism, i.e., what you just see floating above the surface, that you must ignore and focus on what you know to be true. So the power of, of uh, this, this kind of naturalized notion of reality is something that I think Polanyi helps us understand in a, in a way, and we try to generalize in a, 
in, in a broader fashion. Yeah. Carrie Levitt mentioned the fact that your book is probably more determined by the fact that you are Americans. Uh, oh, yeah. And, and what, what about That's that? That's the I mean, worst I, thing you can say. I know. <laughs> no, but seriously, you know, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting point, I think, because uh, is your book not uh, capable of transcending where you position your locality? In, in, or, or but, you, you know, Spinovland is hardly an American concept. Um, that, that, that would be my one disagreement there is that um, I think Spinovland is very hard for Americans. Most people just kind of, their eyes glaze over when the, with that, those several chapters on Spinovland. No, no, but forgive me, what, what I think is, uh, is a very American obsession and problem in social policy does have to do with the idea that uh, somehow social policy and, and uh, if, if it is too generous and it, 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 it spoils the incentive to work and, and you, I mean the, your politics are full of this kind of thing. Sounds like Gerrit uh, Schroeder to me. And, and, um, <laughs> and Spinovland comes in because it has been used by the right in the U.S. in order to make that kind of case against uh, welfare and whatever. And that's a, to my mind a very American issue. Hmm. Bob Kuttner. Well, Boy, it pains me to contradict Carl Polanyi. <laughs> but uh, the Americans did it first. However, in the whole neoliberal era, from Th uh, Thatcher yeah. to, to Gerrit Schroeder, yeah. who had less excuse than anybody else for doing mm -hmm. it, to even the Swedes, to even the Danes. And the Brazilians. You, and, well, but I'm talking about no. the European yeah. Social okay. Democratic heartland. You, you've got European Social uh, Democrats uh, cutting back on welfare benefits for the fear of, uh, of um, having the wrong incentives for the poor. So, yeah, it feels very American, but, but the problem is the, the sort of neoliberalism that started in the Anglo-Saxon countries has now invaded no, the, 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 the continent. No. I, can I have 30 more seconds? Because sure, I meant, yeah. only use eight minutes of my 10 minutes. <laughs> yes, you did. I meant to say this. I think well, I scared you off, but um, now you can go. When I said about doing a review essay pegged to uh, Peggy and, and um, Fred's book, uh, I, I went back and read The Great Transformation, which I first read part of in the 60s and then after the, uh, the essay uh, in International Organization by Ruggie on embedded liberalism when I was teaching international political economy, I went back and read some more of. I think one of the contributions of your book, not to denigrate your book, is it's going to make more people go back and read Polanyi in the original. And the startling thing for me, not having read him in several years, was how amazingly well written the damn thing is. I mean, English was what, his fourth language? Uh, my father? Yeah. Third. third. Third, okay, third, that's right. Second or third. Well, I'm, I'm assuming Hungarian and German. Uh, German was his first language yeah. in Hungarian. Well, the thing two. is, yeah, third, yeah. It's, it's vigorous. He has fun with the prose. He turns a phrase. He's, he's just having a good time writing this. And I think if we can get more people to read the original, uh, not to denigrate the gloss, but uh, uh, both things uh, deserve a read. Jamie Beck, you want to add to what has been said? Are you happy with uh, the rebuttal uh, yeah, of, our, broadly, of our authors? Yeah, I'll just say one, one thing. I think um, if, we, if we look closely at the manufacture of ideas and the, the way in which the, a different distribution of manufacturing system for ideas has been produced, uh, especially the role of think tanks has been critical in that, I would argue. Because what the thing, because of course the Montpellier Society, they were meeting from 1947 and getting absolutely nowhere for 30 years. And um, their ideas got traction when Milton Friedman could give a 20-word answer to the problems of stagflation in the 1970s. It had the moment, and then bang. And then, and, but of course, all of those pat solutions that the neoliberals have been dreaming up in Montpellerin failed. And so the, the ideational process, I would say, is at this level of the think tanks constantly adjusting the ideas to fit the moment. And, um, and the way that they've done that, I think, has been extremely effective. Uh, I've done a lot of work where I've interviewed these people in think tanks, conservative and liberal, and the conservatives 
I interviewed once once used this line to me that we are the motorcycle out, outriders of the political class. We are out there in front of the political yeah. uh, train. We're in front of Thatcher and Reagan, not behind them. Uh, if you look at left think tanks, and I think that's stretching a point to even use that term, <laughs> they cower behind the political class. If yeah. you look at those around Blair that I knew particularly well, they were the minister wants to justify something and the left think tank would try to figure out how to make that fly with the middle class electorate. Mm. They're intellectual chickens in comparison. So yeah, the right have got something very right, I think, about how you produce ideas that work at the moment and you keep adjusting them and you keep adjusting them. And for you know, Hayek described neoliberalism as a flexible credo. It had to be constantly adapted. And that's where its power has come, I think, not from some pristine uh, mountaintop vision, uh, but from its constant adaptation, which the think tanks have been uh, absolutely critical uh, in bringing that about, amount of with a lot of money as well. Uh, but they've also been very smart at it, and um, yeah, producing yeah, what's often called um, yeah, policy-based evidence-making, as opposed to evidence-based <laughs> policy-making, <laughs> is what they do. <laughs> they make evidence that fits the policy. <laughs> Yeah. And the left needs to figure out how to do that. <laughs> Fred, Peggy, last words in 30 seconds. Well, I, 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 <laughs> I, I guess I, I, I want to um, respond to Carrie on the, sure. you know, the, the charge of provincialism. And I, I guess the, um, <laughs> that I, I think it, you would embrace the idea that we're internationalists. I mean, that we... we, we we're essentially consciously trying to overcome the bias of being situated in the uh, belly of the beast in the motherland of, uh, of empire and neoliberalism. So, um, so, um, and you know, I guess I, I've recently had the experience of talking about this set of ideas in in Brazil, in, in Chile, and I do have the, uh, the feeling that these ideas are, are resonant um, um, in, in Latin America and in, in other parts of the world. And I guess, again, that um, we, we didn't, in this, in this volume, deal adequately with the, with the global level of analysis, with the the, the structures of the of the world economy, et cetera, et cetera. But um, another book, another book. Another, yeah. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you both, both for uh, agreeing to uh, submit yourself to this very public scrutiny of your book. Thank you very much. Where is the Design. You all know that the Kaufalani archive, the digital archive, was launched electronically several months ago. Uh, I actually had an extraordinary experience yesterday when I didn't go to try to test it. I've, seen, I've actually done that, and it, and it works very well. It's very accessible. But I needed a date for, for, for an event. And I just Googled the date, uh, and I got the archive. So I thought, this is brilliant. We, um, we really managed to, to bring Kalani uh, to to the universe um, in ways that Carrie, I think, really hoped and intended way, way, way back when, when we created the Institute and had this, what I've always referred to as a living archive, as opposed to it being <clears throat> only uh, inside the library, which is a very valuable place for an archive to be. This was in the Institute under the under the stewardship and, and, and gentle care of, of Anna, on a daily basis of myself and, and, and Carrie. So what we're about to um, launch tonight, I'm going to refer to as the Great Transformation. <laughs> this has a tremendous uh, applicability in lots of circumstances. But uh, if we go back to the mid-1980s, when I began this work with Carrie, we had 50 boxes. And I had a postdoc for two years in a basement, uh, working with all these papers, freezing cold. Uh, with an archivist who would come in periodically with a ruler and she would hit me 
on my shoulder to tell me to stop reading. And I didn't quite understand how you could possibly classify anything without reading it. But I learned that if you, I had read the 97 or 98,000 pages, I think I thought I'd still be in my basement. So we, the great transformation was creating the, the archive, uh, making it accessible. Um, uh, thanks to the help of Fred Block, uh, we were able to get a Rockefeller Foundation grant to um, photocopy <coughs> all the originals onto acid-free paper, which was really important, and that was many years ago. Put together uh, a catalog, um, which is, I've been told, uh, is still a very useful uh, document. But uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, there's more material, and so it, uh, it needs to be uh, updated. But now, with access to this digital archive, uh, everything is possible. We have lots more material to add to the archive that Carrie has contributed. Um, we have, uh, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll save the rest, but I, I have to recognize here the, again, I, I mentioned it this morning, the extraordinary support that Concordia University has given to this project. Uh, in many ways, it was a cottage industry. <laughs> we had no expertise uh, in how to do this. And the university um, uh, basically bankrolled uh, this project with modest funds. And so we had uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of learning to do in order to be able to get it, uh, get it to, where, uh, to where it is uh, today. And uh, I'm going to introduce to you two very important people uh, in a moment. Um, but just to mention <coughs> the uh, Harry Chan, who I will introduce in a moment, who did the actual work and who is a professional in this area, had the misfortune of sitting beside me at an event that had nothing to do with Polanyi or Concordia. It was about children's books. I was invited, and as was he, to an event to encourage children in disadvantaged communities, small children, to read. And he happened to be sitting beside me, and he asked me about my work. Well, here we are. Years later, and uh, he was hooked, uh, and I am extremely, extremely grateful to, to him not only for having done the work, but he was so enthusiastic about the project, about the contents. Uh, so I think he was also doing what I did; he was reading the material uh, because we had some very interesting uh, discussions. So the great transformation from 50 boxes to uh, uh, in a basement to being able to sit at home and Google a date and you get access to the archive. So all students, faculty, researchers, people interested in, in, in the work of Carl Polanyi uh, can do this from home. Uh, this is a, a very, so we're very, very happy to be able to launch this um, with you today. And I'd like to invite, uh, first of all, I'd like to invite Dr. Guillaume Baudry, who's the university librarian uh, here at uh, Concordia University. We've met a couple of times. I know she's quite enthusiastic about this project. We have other uh, work to do together uh, as, we, as we look forward. Um, I would just say a few words about her. She was um, appointed in May 2014. Uh, previously, she was director of the Digital Publishing Center at the Université de Montréal and executive director of Erudit, a publishing platform for scholarly books and journals in the social sciences and the humanities. Uh, Dr. Baudry is also a published author. She has, um, she has two books on, one is La Communication Scientifique et le Numérique, uh, published by University de, de Montréal Press. And I mentioned that one because clearly she has an expertise uh, in, in open source um, uh, knowledge commons and, and the digitization of, of, uh, library, um, of libraries. Uh, I'm delighted that she was able to uh, join us this evening, so I would like to just um, ask her to say a few words uh, to you. Thank you. Thank you, Marjorie. Nice to see you. Good evening, bonsoir. Welcome, bienvenue à Montréal. It's a, it's a pleasure and an honor to welcome you at Concordia for the, the 13th International Calcolani Conference. Congratulations to Margie and Anna for the wonderful organization and such a rich program. Launching a digitized archive is a very special moment. The time it takes is enormous to plan, design, find the budget, prepare the material, scan, <coughs> determine the standards to apply both for images and for records, describe, do the quality control, find a hosting service, 
establish a backup system, and it's not the end of the list of what you have to go through to get all these documents online. But when it is online and people from all around the world are using it, what a satisfaction it is. A sentiment of contentment. Congratulations to Carrie Polanyi Levitt, who started all this, Margie, Anna, and Mr. Chang for this major accomplishment. The phone is online and accessible. Would you want to have a first look at the little notebook Polanyi used between 1934 and 1943? Or while you are writing your article and you don't have at hand the notes you took while you were physically in Montreal? The phone is, and it is 2 a.m. obviously, the deadline is tomorrow morning, and you want to check something on this other note on Marxism and Christianity. In only a few seconds, you are there. It's like magic. This obviously reduces in nothing the value of the papers themselves. Concordia libraries are proud and honored to advise Margie in identifying the conditions to preserve the archives in the best conditions for centuries. Yes, centuries. <coughs> because it is the kind of timeline we are working with as librarians and archivists. On the organization of the current preservation of the archives, we had really little, if nothing, to say. Margie and Anna did an excellent job. We could certainly grant both of them a library and archive degree. <laughs> and it is recently that we began the process of the archives appraisal. We met a few weeks ago with the appraiser to talk about the archives. You probably all use this uh, the very, well, uh, used, very well done and useful archives catalog, what we call in our jargon a research tool. It has nothing to do with Google, but it is a research tool, can you believe it? And, and as in any good publication, there is a pipe, a typo in this one also. <laughs> Do you know what it is? Very funny. <laughs> Our appraiser Very due funny. Is, uh, uh, did his due diligence before meeting with us and read the catalog. At the beginning of our meeting, he shared with us that he was, that he was uh, wondering what kind of archives, what kind of man Polanyi could have been to have produced 738 linear meters of papers. <laughs> <laughs> he was already thinking he would need months to appraise the material. To give you an idea, 738 meters represent 820 library shelves, 117 sections of seven shelves that we usually have in academic libraries. And Margie was presenting Polanyi to uh, our appraiser, saying Polanyi is one of the greatest thinkers in the 20th century. He is a giant. And she was saying that you should have seen his eyes. He was smooth. In fact, there is. It is, there was a, a, a point missing. It is a 7.38 meters. So in your copies, <laughs> in, on page uh, three small eyes, you get the point tonight when you will go home. Because it's not 730. <laughs> uh, to conclude, I want to reiterate uh, the library's support for the Calcolani phone and to Margie's work. I also want to say how easy and inspiring it is to work with you, Margie. Congratulations, uh, Margie and Anna, for this very significant and re remarkable achievement. Thank you. And finally, I'd like to introduce the man who had the misfortune of sitting beside me. <laughs> thinking that we were going to talk about children's books. Uh, it is really a great pleasure for me. I ha actually have not seen um, Harry Chan for quite some time. I'm very happy to welcome you here to, to the university. And Mr. Harry Chan is president of Bibliofish, a library service enterprise that has served the library community since 1969. In 2001, this company developed a leading open source library and information management system that has been adopted by almost 80% of New York State school library system cooperatives. Notice the link. Mm -hmm. 
Biblio Fish developed the Kropolani Digital Archive. This is truly an example of bringing collective enterprise and knowledge commons together. I can't resist saying this given our, our discussions uh, a little earlier today. It's a pleasure for me to welcome you, Harry Chen. Well, thank you, and uh, thank you for inviting me to say a few words about this project. Um, I'm going to be relying on my iPad because it's at this late day, at late time of the day, I, I can't remind for a reason. I cannot count on my memory to remember everything I have to say to you this, 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 this afternoon. But I promise it will be under 10 minutes. So. <coughs> Um, a few years ago, Dr. Mendel and I, as, as uh, I was going to say Dr. Mendel, I used Margie and Dr. Mendel interchangeably, <laughs> sat next to, us, next to each other uh, at a literacy, inter uh, in a literacy initiative inauguration uh, for which we had produced some technology that links, uh, that links volunteer readers and uh, appropriate uh, reading materials and children who uh, were in need of a remedial reading assistance. And so that software was what we had developed there, and that's why I was sitting there in that audience, because the uh, coordinator of that project had invited us to participate in the inaugural uh, event. And um, <coughs> Dr. Marjorie was actually sitting right next to me, and it, and it is true. After that event, we started chatting. And I don't remember if I asked you about what you did, but you did. I remember you asking us about what we did as well. <laughs> and I do remember that uh, you asked about our development team and the kind of technology that we used. And that was kind of interesting because uh, the um, uh, we were able to tell you that uh, uh, that that we did actually are uh, <coughs> developers of open source software. That that is a decision that we made about 12 or 13 years ago. Is from, from that time on was to develop open source software because of the fact that it would be able to deliver uh, quality software and quality services, technological services to <coughs> all, all people at a very reasonable cost. So in any case, Dr. Mendel went, went on to talk, to talk about her role at the Carl Lanyi Library and in, uh, Institute of Library. And, <coughs> and then she went on to describe this vision that she had to create a, a virtual digital library that scholars around the world could access 24-7. And she did, she described that with such passion that we were kind of drawn in. And uh, we decided that uh, we would meet and we would meet at the library and we did meet there and to explore the context. We also met there to, uh, to try and lay out a uh, game plan that would enable us to transform the vision into a reality. At the same time, I have to say that we also met um, Ana Gomez, who is a very important and key person in realizing what we are inaugurating today. Uh, Anna was able to maintain communication uh, with and between Dr. Mendel and me, which is a formidable task because both of us have very peripatetic lives and travel schedules. And uh, however, uh, somehow you managed to do the impossible and in addition to that, Anna also learned to use the technology and reviewed and improved where necessary the digital records. And she continues to do that. So she's taken ownership of this technology so that she can continue to grow the, the database and Dr. Martin, Dr. Mandel together. Oh, well, yeah. Um, I will say that from, uh, Margie was correct in discerning that from the outset our technology team felt at home in this initiative. Besides the fact that all of our programmers uh, are graduates of Concordia University's Faculty of uh, Computer Engineering, so they were quite delighted to work on this project. Um, uh, in, in 2001, as I had mentioned, we had decided to use open source software whenever we could to provide sustainable information, library, and archival services. Our other mission, however, is to help the last be first and with the best technology. So you can understand how pleasantly distracting the documents were as we converted them and added search metadata to each record. It did give us pause for thought that some of Carl Polanyi's documents prophetically described uh, our open source community of approximately 3,000 libraries around the world. These include libraries used by US government leaders, children, 
at the Sidwell Friends School, as well as children attending most UN school libraries and Palestinian settlements throughout the Middle East. Dr. Ma Dr. Mendel writes, Carl Polanyi's work speaks to re-embedding the economy in society to reflect the needs, capacities, and aspirations of citizens and communities. And I would add to that that the open source technology used for the Carl Polanyi Institute Library belongs to the community. This technology paradigm does empower this community to shape its evolution. Dr. Mendel also writes that growing interest in democratizing the economy is inspired by Polanyi's work. And interestingly, this is my comment, uh, finally, uh, we also believe that technology should be a lever to democratize access to information. It has been and is an honor and a privilege to have worked with uh, Margie and Anna Gomez and many others at Concordia. And we look forward to future developments to the further study and application of Carl Palladio's transformative ideas. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and finally, Anna is going to just take a couple of minutes to uh, just to uh, acquaint you with. Oh, there it is. Okay. So if you go down, that is. You have to go down on this. Yay. The resolution is excellent, by the way. There's a lot of handwritten uh, documents, and there you go, everything. Yeah, some of it more difficult to, to read than others, but that's true also of the paper yeah. copies. See? There is a... Mr. Yeah. Yeah. It's remarkable. You can almost feel the texture of, yes. of, the, of the paper. Isn't it fantastic? Yeah. I'm, we're very, very, very grateful to you. This is a wonderful, wonderful project. Thank you so much. Thank you. There you go. So when you go home tonight and you're in, you want to have your tisane, your herbal tea, and your, your slippers, and relax with your iPad um, and your feet up, have a look. It's as easy as that. So the only thing left now is to invite you to come next door and have a glass of wine. But I'd like to celebrate this wonderful, uh, wonderful launch uh, with all of you. Thank you.